Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, you are in the urban agriculture panel, so just making sure you belong here. If you don't, please exit. No, I'm kidding. You're welcome to stay. Um, we're happy to have all of you. Uh, my name is Marianne Cafone. I'm a professor at Loyola. Loyola Law is sponsoring this panel. Don't boo or tomatoes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we, <laughs> we, we love Tulane Law. Actually, we work with everybody here all the time. Um, I'm a professor in the clinical program at Loyola, and so we're very close to all of the Tulane environmental law clinical folks, too. We work with them all the time, which is why we try and sponsor a panel every year at this event, because we think it's great and super important for um, folks near and far to get a look at what's going on in environmental law. So today we're going to talk about urban agriculture, some challenges, and also current uh, policy and legal remedies to some of those challenges that are in the works locally. We have three panelists, myself uh, included. We actually had another gentleman who was joining us today, but he was unable because he is a true farmer and um, is out on his farm today. Uh, it is birthing season for his calves, and I guess it came a little sooner than he expected, so he can't be here with us, so I'm, um, I'm pitch hitting for him. Um, so I also wanted to introduce Kelly Whitaker. Wave, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly's our moderator today. She's a Loyola Law student, and so she'll be up here as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. Hello. So um, Professor Capone pretty much said what I was going to say. Um, I'm a Loyola student, a second year. No, <laughs> That's great. Um, makes it easier for me. Uh, I wanted to thank Tulane for having me and having us. Um, I'm, I, I love the idea of us working together. It means a lot to me. So I want to say thank you. Um, urban ag is really important to me. I was an urban agriculture farmer myself before I came to law school. And I came to, I decided to go to law school specifically because I recognized that there were some missing policies um, in action, and I wanted to help um, encourage better policies surrounding urban ag and also rural ag in general. So, um, okay, so first, uh, our first speaker is going to be David Young, and David Young is the founder and executive director of Capstone 118 Community Farms, which is a small nonprofit that transformed, transformed previously blighted or vacant lots in the Lower Ninth Ward into productive gardens and orchids. Located in part of a food desert, Capstone grows and provides food at no cost to those who need it. It also assists others in starting gardens or offers available space on Capstone lots for people to grow their own food. So without further ado, please welcome David Young. Good afternoon. Does this thing on at all? Yeah. yeah. Whoops. Thank you for inviting me here, and hopefully I'll share a little bit of things that will be of interest. Um, if you're wondering about the sling, I tore my rotator cuff actually when I was in Washington, D.C. to speak at the Wash University of D.C. Urban Ag Forum. So just had surgery February 1st. I'm still in the healing process. Um, and one thing that they so adamantly pointed out at UDC that I'll just share here is if you have a true interest in urban agriculture, UDC is the only fully urban agriculture um, land grant college. So the only thing they focus on is urban agriculture. Not trying to give them a plug, but um, having dealt with land grant colleges and agriculture since the 70s, I was just totally amazed to hear that. And then one of the other things they talked about as we talk about urban agriculture is if their drive to become a state um, goes through, then they will be the only 100% urban state. Um, Marianne had asked me to speak on some of the challenges that we've faced through the years. Um, I actually founded Capstone in 2009 and purchased my first lot in 2010. Had not intended to actually grow into the urban agriculture scene like we had or have, but I planted a small personal use garden that was four foot by 14 foot. 
and soon realized that other people were eating from that garden and a greater need for food than what I probably had. And so we just kept expanding. And for the first two years when I was gardening on that lot, all I knew was people in my community needed food. I was able to grow it and provide some of that healthier food for them. It was only two years later when I was looking at grants on how to expand that I even heard the term food desert. And so um, I'm not saying it's not a legitimate term, but it's a government designation and it has very specific criteria that are much more advanced than what I just personally saw happening in my own community. Um, but there are grant funds available if you can use that grant terminology properly. Um, my first expansion was in cooperation with uh, Propeller and New Orleans Rede Redevelopment Authority. I'll refer to them as NORA from now on. And they did a pitch competition and in my first year, two years of growing and sharing food, I constantly heard from people, do you have any fruit? We need fruit. So my pitch was to develop a community fruit and citrus orchard. Um, came in first place. That gave us the privilege of spending all of our first place winning money, plus a lot more to buy two lots from Nora to put our orchard in. Otherwise, those properties were not even available to buy at any price. Um, so making those properties available is probably one of the nicest things you'll hear me say about Nora today. <laughs> um, since 2010, we've given around 15 to 16,000 food pounds of food away to people in need. We've rehabbed a total of 40 previously blighted and vacant lots in the Lower Ninth Ward. Many of those have been returned to other family members or back to the organizations they came from. Um, we're currently operating, when I counted this morning, uh, sometimes lots, sometimes come and go. Um, this morning, when I counted up, we're actually operating on 15 different lots right now. And I'm going to just tell you how we acquired some of those and some of the issues that go along with those different types of acquisition processes. So, as I said, our first lot I bought in 2010, I bought that on a bank foreclosure. And at that point in time, it had been listed for a while, and I waited, knew I couldn't afford it, and went back one last time and was convinced by one of the neighbors when I was telling her, I can't afford to buy this. She says, well, it'll be good to have you here. Welcome, neighbor. And I said, but I can't afford it as she's walking off. So I called the realtor and the realtor says, well, they just reduced it, so make an offer. I said, I can't even afford the offer on what they've reduced it to. She says, make any offer. And so I got my first lot for $2,500 because that was, that literally by the time we got with, done with closing took me to where I had less than $100 available. Um, so then from there, as I said, two years later, that with winning the Pitch Nola competition, that brought in a lot of exposure we had offers from Habitat for Humanity to lease lots. We currently have one where we have a small orchard. We actually have adopted that from a lease someone else had for Habitat. And after we had started our first 30 tree orchard, he liked what we were doing, but didn't do his research, didn't plant trees properly, let them die, um, let the wind blow them out, had lost all interest, and about a month after I sent him an email, I said, Jack, you gotta at least mow around the trees. You can't even find them. Month later, I got a call from Habitat, and they said, it appears Jack's lost all interest. Do you wanna take over and start a new lease? So that's our one property we have. 
Altogether, we've had five other properties from Habitat. Uh, for various reasons, we've turned those back in. I'll typically give a lot three years for us to make it productive because keep in mind, every lot we work on before Katrina had a house on it. So it's trying to determine, has this been cleaned up good? Or do we have cement slab under six inches of soil? Or do we have footings and pilings to deal with? And I've got a kind of a personal rule that operating on very low income, being a 100% volunteer organization, we say if it takes two people or a broken shovel to move it, we work around it. Um, and we have some that if we can't do in-ground gardening, then we'll look and see if we can plant fruit and citrus trees there. Um, so we currently have the one lot where we've got some trees that's from Habitat. We've got another lot with some fruit and citrus on it from St. Bernard Project. They had two lots side by side. They built a house on one. The other's too small, so they leased to, to us five-year perpetual renewing lease. Um, we have a couple in Australia that came to the city, fell in love with a lot, and they weren't going to stay yet, but they bought that property, and through a process of having leased it to a couple of other folks that didn't honor their agreements, ended up leasing it to us when they saw what we were doing. We've got a 10-year lease on that, and he said, if we like what you're doing at the end of 10 years, we'll probably just sign it over to you. And that's one of our lots that's on the Holy Cross side. Uh, I've got some lots that a person in Los Angeles has, the tax certificates. Are you guys familiar at all with what tax certificates are? That's when the city takes something that has back taxes and rather than you just informally paying the back taxes and then after three years say, I want it, the city actually does an online auction. You pay the back taxes, pay the current taxes for three years, the city monitors it, the current owner has the opportunity to pay everything you've paid plus penalty and interest. After three years, you have the option of applying to get full title or what I just recently found out if you don't want to start that process yet even if they do come back they have to give you what you ask for the property and then <coughs> if you don't accept that then you're required to apply for the full title and that comes into play with us where I'm looking to grow food on them as opposed to wanting to sell them I don't need a full title to grow food. Um, the titling process could quite often be twice as much as what the property value of these properties are. So for me, unless we come up with a specific need to sell them or construct on them, we'll probably just continue to pay taxes and let it be in that state of limbo without spending $7,000 to get a title on a $5,000 property because it has to go through advertising, attorneys, court, and all this. The one thing that I found out with the tax certificates is even though online it says no hidden fees and all this, um, you have to do good background research. I bought the tax certificate on the one. The next tax year, I got the tax statement, and it's got a $6,000 demolition lien listed as due for taxes. So I sent an email to the treasurer, never got any response. Talked to my friend Mary Ann here for some legal advice, and we decided to just wait and see what happened. The next year, the tax lien was gone, but there was a $1,300 new fee for miscellaneous fees. 
So I decided just to get the tax statement down to a zero balance, go ahead, pay that $1,300 miscellaneous undefined fees, um, because if you're supposed to be paying the back in current taxes and you leave any part of it underpaid, then you've lost everything you've put into it. So it's like the city has you right where they want you. Um, when I called the auction company about the lien and their statement of no hidden fees, they said, well, didn't you do good research? I said, no, I took your word for it. And, and they said, well, the city doesn't always tell us everything. So um, I have someone in Los Angeles who has the tax certificate on two lots. And since he doesn't actually own them, we can't do a formal lease. Because if his owner comes back and pays him, then he's got to turn them back over, and a lease does me no good. So we just have an email user agreement. And um, he says he is going to, at the end of the three years, go ahead and apply for the title and then still continue to let me use them because he has no immediate plans. Once he has that property in his name, then we can do a formal lease agreement. Um, let's see. I've got my own personal house that I bought from a estate when they listed it. And it's been now rebuilt twice since Katrina. It was rebuilt in 2007 and they didn't treat right for termites. And so when I bought it in 2012, all the load bearing walls were gone. The back wall was completely just a solid termite mess. So for the second time since Katrina, we gutted it and over two years times uh, and about 60 volunteers rebuilt it. I bought the lot beside me from Nora. I applied for alternative use program that they had at that time. That's where you're going to do something that will be green, not building on it. Currently we have an aquaculture system on there. It's the largest one in the city. Um, I applied talking with the guys who were the representatives during Pitch Nola, and to this day, even their replacements call me one of their shining stars for their programs. Um, these guys told me for six months, oh yeah, we just gotta staff it, you're approved, all that, no problem. Finally, six months later, they didn't even tell me. They told someone from Propeller who told me that they said, oh, David can't buy that lot under the alternative use program because he lives right next door. So they forced me to buy it under the lot next door program, which instead of getting it for $1,500, cost me over 5000 And then it took me another six months to get my application deposit back. But they think this is all just the way you're supposed to do things. Um, Currently, I've never participated, but they, I don't know if it's still going, but they have a growing green program where they'll give you a lease on property. It's supposed to be three years lease to own. Well, the way it actually operates is they give you a non-recordable lease, which as legal people know that you can't take that to court, so you may as well not have a lease. Um, the one place they sent them a letter and they said, well, your compost bin is empty, so it's an eyesore, so you need to get it off of our lot. Then their next letter, where they ended up hiring an attorney to respond, was said, well, kale is not listed on your use list, so since kale is not an edible food, <laughs> and so they responded, well, kale is edible, Well, they think, it's, they think it's only ornamental, so when you get kale, just look at it. Um, and so they said, well, even if kale is edible, it wasn't on your list of what you're going to do, so you need to give us a new use list. Um, I can tell you at least six lots had have been sold from producers mid-term of their lease that obviously is not enforceable. 
um, had another guy told me he was trying to get four lots. And he kept telling me, well, I've been talking with my friends at Nora. I said, you don't have friends at Nora. He said, yeah, we're good buds. I said, do you have a valid lease? He says, no, they keep telling me we got to do that. I said, you are in so much trouble. And finally, after a year and a half, they sold those lots to somebody else. And he calls me up crying and he says, I don't know what happened. My friends just sold all those lots we'd been talking about and I'd been using. And I said, yeah, that's what they do. And so, um, you know, I don't have a very bright picture to paint for Nora. Uh, let's see. The one thing that I do, I've, I've learned to evaluate what I'm going to invest in a property as well as even the basis for getting that property. The one big example I have is had a half acre property all fenced in. It was eight lots from a family with 12 siblings. They had a lease to another organization that initially did some farming and then they decided that wasn't their thing. So it sat unused for a year or two. Then they finally gave me a sublet for it. I operated on it for three years, put a lot of money into getting water access there, a lot of money into cleaning it up and everything else. And then one day I got a call from the LSU Ag agent and he says, there's a mowing crew over here mowing over all your gardens and there's two guys here who say they own this lot. And so I got over there and we had, what I found out was one of the siblings and a nephew. And the nephew was a hot hit. He's a retired NBA star and used to having everything he wants when he wants it. Um, has a very violent temper to the point where the one day he's waving a machete around his head screaming, we've got this under control. The next day he threatened to burn everything I own to the ground. Um, what I found out after the fact is with Katrina, everyone except the oldest sister had left New Orleans. They left all the family sites behind and told a lady who at that time would have been in her 60s, just take care of everything. Her method of taking care of it with eight family lots was to lease them to the other nonprofit. What I found out three years after I started in, when they finally came back 11 years after Katrina, they decided they wanted that lot and those lots to look like their family yard right then. That's when I found out the older sister was the only one who signed the primary lease. And so a sublet off of an invalid lease doesn't get you anywhere. And so let's see what else. What I kind of gauge, three minutes done or three to go? Oh, okay. Well, I got a lot of notes here. Um, okay, I mentioned water access. The city of New Orleans does have a process where you can get water for paying for the water only as opposed to sewage, which is based on water usage, three times more water, plus your sanitation or trash disposal. I've done that process three times. The quickest took a year and a half to get the billing right. During that process, I had, and it, it's going to run you, depending on the cost of your plumber, about $1,000. Um, during that year and a half, I had the water turned off twice, listening to the instructions of the Water and Sewage Board, who told me, well, just pay the water usage. That's when I got the water turned off, and then they turned me over to a collection agency. So that took a year and a half. I met with the since-retired director of the Sewage and Water Board, and I got partway through talking about that, and she goes, stop, I've heard enough. I said, oh, I got a lot more. I got all the dates documented. She goes, no, 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 I've heard enough. 
to know that there's a problem because this is not the first time we've done this. I said, maybe, but you don't have it right yet. So in the other two, um, same thing, same issues. I didn't get turned over to collection agency, but we actually ended up with about two years of credit until they got it right because I continued to pay the full bill. Um, then on the third one was at the orchard. We had to bust out the sidewalk to get to the pit for the meter because it impeded partway into the sidewalk, but it was about this deep below grade. So I put in a work order to get the meter pit brought up to grade so I could finish putting the sidewalk back together. That was in 2012. I've had three work orders. Um, one was canceled by the meter reader. They read me her notes and it says, there's no need to have a water meter here. It's only a vacant lot. So they have meter readers deciding if you actually need water or not. Um, they've had a new regulation a couple years ago that if you're going to use it for garden use only, you don't have to have backflow preventers, which have to be inspected every year at another $1,000 cost. Um, you can use a double check valve. If everything's on garden hose and above ground, then that's all legal now, except the one inspector red tagged me. When I finally called him, he says, you have some grass growing around your hose. I consider that to be an underground installation. And he says, so we're going to shut you down, make you put in the um, more expensive double check or the backflow preventers. And I said, well, I'll unhook them. He says, well, that's fine. I'm still going to shut it off because I know as soon as I'm done, you'll change it back. So I ended up calling my plumber who did the initial filing and then his supervisor. And we finally got that worked out. Um, but I've got some other things that I can share when we get to the Q&A time, if you guys have questions. But once again, thank you for having me here and I'll turn it over to our next person. Thank you, David. Um, just as a side note, I know there's probably a lot of law students and lawyers in here, and um, I personally find myself in need of sun. So last fall, I had the privilege of volunteering at um, Capstone, David Young's farm. So if you're ever in need of some sun, I'm sure he would love some volunteers. So you can just um, contact him about that. Or community service hours. So or community graduate. service hours to graduate, because I know we all need pro bono hours as well. Um, our next speaker is Sean Pepper Bowen. She's the founding director of Culinary Center for Food Law Policy and Culture. She is also co-chair of the New Orleans Food Policy Advisory Committee and a steering committee member of Regional Sustainability Committee. Pepper holds a BS in com Computer Information Systems from Tulane University, an MS in Computer Information Technology with a concentration in e-commerce, and a JD from Loyola University School of Law in New Orleans with certificates in both environmental and international laws. Thank you, Pepper. Good afternoon, you guys. Thank you and welcome for uh, welcome and thank you for having me. Um, so the stories that David was telling are sadly not uncommon. And many of the folks that we end up working with and advocating for from the Food Policy Advisory Committee as well as private practice um, through to some of the things that... Keep talking. Ah. No, no, no. <laughs> to some of the things that uh, the uh, environmental advocacy class does uh, that Professor or Marianne Capone actually teaches over at Loyola, all of these things are incredibly important and intertwined. So as co-chair of the Food Policy Advisory Committee, I am here to talk to you today a little bit about some of the comprehensive, comprehensive zoning ordinance challenges as well as FPAC itself. So. FPAC 
is a group that is made up of some really amazing folks who are working within the food systems in all different phases. So anywhere from growers to producers to attorneys who are interested in ensuring that we do have locally owned and products, locally grown food for those who are in need. Our vision is to have a sustainably, sustainable, culturally appropriate food, and what culturally appropriate means is simply that we are not importing a lot of food from outside of the area. So the idea of culture being combined with food is something that unfortunately many of us don't think about terribly often, but I like to bring to people's attention, especially around here, so we are just coming up on spring break, and just say for the sake of argument that we no longer had crawfish. What would you do for the entire spring break and most of spring, generally. And so, those things that grow in your area, those things that you grew up with on your plate, those things that you associate with home are culturally appropriate for you and your region. Those things that are outside of that scope does not make them bad, wrong, or indifferent. It just makes them someone else's culturally appropriate food. Uh, all our work is guided by the tenets of equity, sustainability, economic opportunity, collaboration, etc. And what that means is simply that we are extremely focused on ensuring that folks like David, who are urban farmers, who are trying to remediate the land, who are putting a lot of work, time, energy, and effort into doing just that, are not being disenfranchised in some way. Um, a lot of the contracts, the, the, the leases that David spoke of, although those seemingly unbelievable for those of you who have any knowledge of the law whatsoever, uh, seemingly illegal for some of you who know anything about the law, um, especially when we start talking about non-recordable leases. They are real. And they are also something that seems not to be a, a point where we can actually manipulate or maneuver within the city government, which is uh, disheartening. We'll call it that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we have three working groups and two co-chairs. What that means is that we break our focus into three areas, one being food production. So on that group, we work with urban farmers, we work with folks who are interested in supporting urban farmers in order to ensure that we identify strategies and expand growth, growing food production, market opportunities, and processing infrastructure. And all of those words say a lot of really interesting things what we just really want to do is to make sure if you're growing it here, we can get it to a market here, you can buy it here. We also have a business development team. Uh, these are the guys who are working on access, increasing access to economic opportunity. These are folks as uh, David was mentioning he'd worked with Propeller, folks like Propeller, for folks like Market Umbrella, folks who are actually, uh, if not directly supporting the businesses themselves are finding resources to connect to economic opportunities so that if you are a person who say has a citrus tree in your backyard and what you really want to do on a Saturday morning is to sell your jam at the uh, at the farmers market that we are figuring out some sort of a way to connect you from your idea and your grandma's recipe to the farmers market where consumers can buy. We also have food access, which is where we are working with institutions in order to ensure that community partners, institutions, think uh, jails, hospitals, schools, everyone in between has access to fresh and local, fresh and locally grown foods. And although this doesn't seem like a really big deal, in the grand scheme. So if, so if anyone out there is thinking to themselves, as long as we've got farmer's markets and I can buy my kale on Saturday morning, we're good. Take a step back and think about the volume of food that is available in a school. The numbers of people that you feed in hospitals, not just those who are admitted, but also their family and friends who come to visit. Those folks who are in other institutions, for whatever reason, are also consuming food on a daily basis. So if we can make things 
more easy for any urban farmers, any fishermen, any ranchers, anyone who's producing locally to get into those arenas, then we not only win by supporting them as a business, but we also in, have an influx of money into our local economy that we would not have, our, would not have otherwise had. So our mission, as mentioned before, is to shape public policy and improve equity, opportunity, and collaboration. We are based on a coalition, a broad-based um, uh, broad based coalition of organizations, businesses, and individuals who are working to make this happen. And the reason is this set of fast facts. So first and foremost, you need to eat. And I recognize that, especially around finals, that that does become somewhat negotiable. <laughs> but as a general rule, you do need to consume something on a daily basis. Conversely, we are faced with 41 million people in the United States that are faced with hunger and struggle with food access and food security on a regular basis. We have nearly 100,000 New Orleanians who are food insecure. And just to step back for a second, food access is just that you have a way to obtain food. Not that you get it on a regular basis. Not that you can afford to continue to feed yourself. That is food security. Food security is ensuring that you and your family have enough to eat consistently in order to promote growth for not only you but also your family. So when you think about a hundred thousand people in New Orleans on a regular basis are not entirely sure how much and how they are going to eat on a daily basis is somewhat unsettling. When we talk about food, we're talking about locally grown as a, as a general rule. We're talking about those things that are some sort of fresh produce that is either an underutilized species or an invasive <coughs> species in order to, to balance the environment and the impacts thereon. So that said, eating helps keep you alive. And eating fruits and vegetables can keep you healthy. This is important for other reasons like Louisiana is in the lead in several areas and I just want to make sure that you know about them. We are fourth in high blood pressure. We are fifth in obesity and eighth in diabetes. These are odd, right? That's all I got, right? So the the bottom line on this, folks, is that uh, these diseases are preventable diseases and they are food related. When we stop eating or at least decrease the amount of of uh, fats as well as sugars and salts that we consume on a daily basis, replace them with locally grown fruits and vegetables, then we do have a less lesser chance, or excuse me, a diminished ch chance or opportunity of developing pre preventable diseases because by definition they are preventable. But moving on. So the lack of healthy food access contributes to these preventable diseases. We talked earlier, or rather David mentioned earlier, the food deserts, and I personally love the term food desert. I really do. And the reason I do is because of the way that we frame it, uh, not from a legal perspective, but from a social perspective. When you think of food deserts, we think of the corner store where you can get cigarettes or you can get um, meats, you can get liquor, you can even get your oil changed, but you can't get fresh produce. You can, but for some reason, we never stop to think that if you live in a neighborhood where you have a high-end wine store, where you have a boulangerie, where you have a cheesemonger, or even some guy who's in the back butchering, you are still in a food desert. You still have no access to fresh produce. You still do not have the same opportunities to go outside and say to yourself, you know what, I have really just wanted some kale today. Because it requires you leaving that neighborhood and going elsewhere. So when we start talking about food deserts and conversely food swamps, on a very social justice side of things, remember that we are looking at it through a lens of charity and we are thinking about these people as if they are making decisions that we would not ordinarily make. And I can personally tell you, I have chosen the liquor store and the cheesemonger on a regular basis. So 
as we promote uh, local owned farms and uh, we use them to increase access, part of that is that we do have a number of neighborhoods where we have a highly pedestrian um, population. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that these are folks who are catching the bus at six in the morning to go and work at a manual job. This means we've got folks who also live in areas where it costs too much to park their cars. I got this. <laughs> And so instead of having to take an Uber or a taxi or order in from Amazon, uh, what they end up doing is going someplace that's close. So if we can go someplace that is close in order to get to fruit and vegetables, so much the better, mainly because, again, uh, we ordinarily don't have access, and that is in part because we only have 32 full-service grocery stores in the city. So, and... <laughs> Urban farms are typically on small plots, right? So when you think of an urban farm, think of a house that used to be there and now it's not there anymore. And in New Orleans, that's somewhere around a third of an acre, right? So you're not thinking about it, you're not looking at a lot of land. You're looking at being very efficient, very compact, and growing local plants, even fish and flowers on small plots. This is super important in areas where you don't have any other access. And local farming or urban farming actually generates revenue, excuse me, and promotes local jobs. There are so many things that can be accomplished just by spending local and putting money back into your local economy, up to and including the reduction of, uh, redu excuse me, the reduction of storm runoff. That if you are using the land in order to farm, it is not concrete, right? So the, the water is absorbed by the ground. I'm just making sure you're still with me. Um, and, and because it is growing green things, you also get the added benefit of improving air quality. You know, the problem comes in because we've talked about how amazing this is and certainly who doesn't want an orchard in their backyard, but we have a few challenges here and there. Uh, and let me let you know, I'm also very, very good at understating things. So the New Orleans Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance is what we use to establish how and what parts of the land in the city are used. So, um, or excuse me, are allocated. So this is all your land use, and we have areas that are zoned for residential, we have commercial, we also have high and light industrial, and these restrictions make growing in the city more difficult. So I'd mentioned earlier that if you're looking at a plot of land in the city, it's somewhere around a third of an acre. For livestock, you need by CZO ordinance uh, an acre. You need an acre for livestock, uh, and that's large livestock. For rabbits and ducks and more than six chickens, you require 50 feet, but you also require a specialty uh, space for them. And then things get super complicated because, well, not everybody's got that much space, right? So you think of your typical New Orleans backyard. Do you have an extra 50 feet to put a house and then to move it 20 feet from the fence line and to ensure that somehow or other it's not bothering your neighbor? Um, raised beds, for instance. There is soil testing that is required prior to the, dis the establishment of agricultural use, even though you don't need the soil for a raised bed. And the point of the raised bed is that you don't use the soil. So it ends up being this really cyclical Catch-22, we'll call it that. Uh, processing. Processing by the standards of the USDA are very, very loose, and that includes just trimming the leaves from fresh produce, uh, washing it, and bringing it to sale. Now, I'm not saying that this makes any sense because I see the faces and the shaking of the head as if this, you're, I'm losing you. This is just the way the ordinances are written. And so these are the challenges that are faced every day by these the, the good folks of the, uh, of the area who are trying to grow the local food, uh, excuse me, produce and fruit, vegetables and fruit. 
the opportunities that we have that would make things a lot easier for them is if we would do simple things <laughs> like, <laughs> like giving the urban farmers the same tax incentives as the rural farmers, like creating an exception for public utility requirements on structures like sheds <laughs> so that urban farmers could have them in, the, in their backyards and instead of having to move things or even put in, well, again, public utilities. And, uh, Silly, simple things like relaxing the regulations on chickens and honeybees so that we support farming and so that we support local production as opposed to impeding it. So, with all of that said, the very next time you are at your local farmer's market and you think to yourself, how did this come to be and how amazing is it to have local citrus and what on earth do I do with kakutsa? Know that these are all local things and that there are groups and people who are fighting on a daily basis in order to make sure that you continue to have access to local food and local, local fruits and vegetables and just in case you were thinking to yourself you know what I really want to do is to learn more about what FPAC's doing. We've got some handouts that are right here not enough for everybody because these are the fancy copies but if, uh, if we need to we can go and make some more and thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Pepper. Okay, our next speaker um, is a professor of mine um, that I have right now, who I really adore. So, um, uh, Marianne Cafone is an environmental attorney and a longtime food justice advocate. She's the executive director of the Recirculating Farms Coalition. She runs the Environmental Policy Lab and the Environmental Law Program at Loyola Law and sits on assorted advisory boards for the city of New Orleans, federal and state governments, and nonprofit organizations. She's admitted to practice law in Louisiana, Florida, and the United States Supreme Court. Please welcome Marianne Cafone. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'm going to have a little malfunction here for one second while I talk to you. But, um, you know, I think it was pretty clear what we're seeing is that um, that urban farmers in New Orleans don't have the easiest time. I mean, that was really what this whole discussion was about up until just now. Um, David gave a bunch of examples, uh, land challenges, water challenges, Pepper talked more about access challenges. And um, what I want to talk about is sort of the, the bigger picture, too, where we as a city uh, of growers fit into the national picture and also some opportunities that are coming up to hopefully remedy some of these issues. <clears throat> I'm going to be pretty brief because I actually want to have some discussion time um, about these things. I think uh, you probably have some questions about what's happening in the city and uh, the laws around that and I see a couple of my farming folks in the audience that we can also talk to so I think we can um, have a pretty good discussion. So um, I wear a couple of hats. Kelly mentioned that I'm also the executive director of the Recirculating Farms Coalition. That is a national nonprofit. We work with growers, uh, all growers, but we also especially work with those who do aquaponics, hydroponics, and aquaculture, so water-based water growing. Um, but we have members in our coalition, uh, everybody who do raised beds and soil-based, and we ourselves do um, raised beds in ground aqua and aquaponics these days. Um, we have a local farm in Central City on O.C. Haley. So, you know, I've been working in um, urban ag for, I guess, maybe now 12 years. And some of the challenges that I've seen over time, especially in the legal and policy context, is uh, urban farmers being recognized as real growers. Um, we fight pretty regularly with USDA about offering support to our urban farmers. We've done a couple of series with USDA these days about getting our growers here the same type of benefits as um, those who have rural farms. So things like loans or insurance or um, 
equipment, you know, a USDA does a bunch of equipment share, but you have to be a real farmer and you have to prove that you have a real farm and you have to register your farm before you can get access to any of those benefits. And um, I in the past, USDA, we would come and we'd say, well, I have a tenth of an acre and they'd literally laugh you out the door like, are you kidding me? That's not a farm. Um, but now they really have opened up to this over time. We've been perpetually dragging them out to urban farms and showing them that we're growing real food and that they look like real farms and that our growers are in fact real farmers producing real food for real people in a city that desperately needs it. So things, things are happening uh, in that arena. We also really desperately need uh, more policy and legal support. There are uh, a number of attorneys these days in New Orleans, Pepper, soon to be Kelly, <laughs> me, Emily Posner, there's a handful of others who are working with the, with the growers here to um, change the laws and change the policies. And that means amending the CZO, like Pepper said, the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance, um, and also trying to make national and state level legislation that support urban growing in our city and other places. <clears throat> So one of the things I wanted to talk about today is that we actually have um, a National Urban Agriculture Act happening at the federal level. It was introduced originally in 2016 by Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. Um, we expect it to be introduced again this year since the Farm Bill. For those of you who are not familiar with that, that's the national law that pretty much deals with uh, everything that has to do with food and farming. It's literally not just farming, but it's also school food and SNAP and WIC benefits and, and everything. It's an enormous law and if you ever get a chance to read an overview, I highly recommend it because it's very interesting and very intricate. So this National Urban Ag Act that we're hoping to see introduced would uh, essentially become a part of the Farm Bill and would be reauthorized on the same schedule as that. It integrates urban farming into, the, into U.S. agriculture, meaning it offers grants, support, and some of the other programs I was talking about to urban growers, which would be really great. So one of the super cool things about the um, National Urban Ag Act is that we're actually hoping for bipartisan support. Agriculture is kind of one of those cross-cutting issues that um, everybody kind of loves. You know, like we all need to eat, like Pepper said, and we all really want access to good food. And, um, you know, it's one of those things that, that seems to be uh, amenable to both sides of the aisle. And so we're actually hoping for some cooperation here. And um, we're actually hoping for cooperation from our very own Senator Cassidy here in Louisiana. Um, as you probably know, Senator Cassidy is also a medical doctor and so has some interest in health and wellness. And so we're kind of pitching him on that aspect of things that, hey, doc, um, we have a sick state that you represent. Uh, what were our stats again? Fifth in obesity, fourth in blood pressure, eighth in some other terrible things, diabetes. So we have a sick state and you represent us and, hey, don't you want to help us get healthier? So we'll see what happens. Um, also, we've been uh, pushing him on that uh, New Orleans itself is a leader in urban ag, that we have a lot of farms here. Maybe y'all don't know that, but we do. We have uh, a list of urban growers here, and we have over 75 people on that list. And so we have quite a number uh, of farms here and many more coming. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're a good place for uh, the Urban Ag Act to be sponsored. So I just wanted to quickly go over some of the local uh, initiatives that we're working on that will also appear in the, in the National Urban Ag Act. One is green roofs. You heard David and also Pepper talk about how space is a challenge. Even though we have something like 35,000 empty lots, it's actually really hard to get access to them. Um, real estate in New Orleans has been perpetually becoming more valuable, and landlords in New Orleans perpetually want to make more money. And um, leasing to a farmer maybe isn't the most you know, financially um, beneficial use for these landowners. And that's a challenge for farmers because a lot of landowners would rather see their lots go empty and sit there um, in the hope that in the future they can make a million dollars off of it rather than let a farmer work on it and, um, you know, have that lot appear to be taken. So that's a big challenge. So we started talking about what can we do about that. You know, even though we have all these abandoned and blighted lots, um, if we can't use those, maybe we can go up. And so we started talking with the city council and the state about 
uh, instituting a green roofs initiative. And that would mean um, that businesses and hopefully to residences would get some kind of tax credit for um, having a green roof. That way um, they would reduce energy, uh, it also reduces heat, and it's a, it's a nice uh, ecological benefit, it's a nice personal benefit for the business or the residents, and uh, it would be a great benefit for fur growers because essentially, you know, a business or a resident might contract with a farmer to put the green roof on, the farmer gets a place to grow, and the business and the resident gets a free green roof. <laughs> So that's what we're hoping. Um, so we're really working on a, a tax in incentive right now to see if we can get the city council on board, see if we can get the state on board. Hi, Kevin. Say hi. Kevin's one of my students, and he's actually working on this as a project this semester. So if you have any interest, you can talk to him. Um, so we think it's a win-win. Uh, that it would be great for businesses, residents, and also growers. Fingers crossed that other people think that too. If you have interest, this picture is uh, Brooklyn Grange in New York City. It's an amazing farm. My friend runs it. Um, and it is literally uh, several acres of a farm on top of a rooftop in Brooklyn. Very cool. So the second thing that we've been talking about is these lots. And how do we get more landowners to agree to actually have a real contract with growers here? Because that's part of our challenge, too, is that there are people purporting to be landowners who aren't and making leases with people and then people being sued for trespass. Um, you know, as David said, somebody signs a lease, but they're one member of a family, and the next thing you know, all of your crops are being plowed over. I mean, we really have had a lot of um, drama and trauma here with urban farming, and it just shouldn't be the case. So the other thing is that a couple years ago, actually one of my students um, <clears throat> worked on an Urban Ag Incentive Act, <laughs> perhaps somebody in the front row um, who spoke before me, uh, worked on an Urban Ag Incentive Act and got it passed at the state level in Louisiana. So we actually have this on the books, thanks Pepper, um, and, uh, and it needs to be implemented at the local level. So we are still uh, working with the city council to, um, to get it implemented in the, in the city of New Orleans. So the state has agreed to it and now we need it at the city level. And that would be really great. We're hopeful that that, that will happen in the next year or so. So the last thing I just wanted to say, what can you do? Well, you know, we're here all, uh, you know, crying about what's happening in urban farming and talking about some of the opportunities that we have to fix this, but we really, we need help. Um, a handful of people can make a difference, but even more voices make an even bigger difference more quickly. And our city needs food. Um, everybody wants access to healthy, fresh food. We are uh, a city of uh, an amazing cultural, um, feeling toward food, but everybody's food opportunities and experiences are not the same. And we need to work uh, on leveling that. Um, so if you are interested and if you are willing, especially those of you who are going to be or are just becoming lawyers, your voice really matters and this is a great thing to work on um, as a, a beginning, which is call your city council and get involved in the process. Call your state legislatures and get involved in the process, legislators, and get involved in the process. You can sign some petitions. You can help these growers grow and do more for our city. Thanks. So what I'd like to do now is um, have everybody who was on the panel take questions. I think I'm just going to field them from here, if that's OK, unless you want to do it, Kelly. You want to do it? I'll happily do it. But um, if any, anybody have any questions for any of our speakers? I mean, so I, I'm also on FPAC. Um, Pepper's our, our co-chair, and I don't, I don't know. I don't really feel like we have those issues. In uh, what do you think? I mean, I don't really feel like we have those issues. I just always feel like there's something that's more important. Right. So as Maria mentioned, uh, most people can get behind the idea of food, and mm -hmm. um, nobody likes to be the person that says, "No, I don't want to feed people." <laughs> so uh, 
we we do do it. We just don't say that mm -hmm. uh, when we start uh, addressing or uh, removing social support and ensuring that folks who are formerly incarcerated can't get food. But we never say that's what we're doing. Right. So what we end up with, especially if, uh, from Marianne's work and uh, through FPAC and through like some of the other folks who are working around town and doing things, um, we end up with folks who are willing to say that they, that they will work on it. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of folks, a call to action, yep. call your, your council person. We have people who commit, we have people who sort of, sort of wishy-washy in the implementation. But we never have a, a hard no, and I, I've never known a backdoor deal over cucumbers. <laughs> but it could have happened, mm -hmm. and if it is happening, I want to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> There's an upside to that, right? <laughs> and I've now seen it come into the growing aspect, but I've also done construction on the site for 40 years, mm -hmm. and I did see it take place with an apartment renovation because the utility's been out for six months, and so they had to bring everything up to code. Mm -hmm. And the plumber at the time says, well, your owner has three options. Either tear apart these finished walls so the inspector can see every pipe joint, or you fix the obvious things and pay them a little bit, mm -hmm. or you don't fix anything and pay them a lot. Right. And so I was there when the inspector came, mm -hmm. and the plumber, and he went outside, plumber had a nice envelope and he came back in without the envelope but he says we passed our inspection <laughs> I said yeah. do you mean to tell me bribery is alive and well in New Orleans he says has been <laughs> always will be it's the only way you can survive yeah, yeah that's what I thought I paid a ticket like that uh, traffic ticket in Tijuana <laughs> <laughs> I just want to ask, I, I uh, sometimes help somebody who has um, a small plot and gardens, um, but he could use some assistance with uh, getting connections, how to sell the food, so uh, is that the yeah. of your organization that... Uh, yeah, so we, we, do have, we do have some folks who belong to FBAC who are involved in, again, uh, some of the farmers markets, there are also some folks who are involved in, in uh, large organizations like Save Second Harvest. Um, we've got some people who are involved in, uh, who are rather restaurateurs, so like Liberty's Kitchen, for instance, that's on our board now, or, yeah, mm -hmm. or steering committee. And so the, um, so the idea is that, yeah, I, I'll give you my card and we can cool. connect and, and find some sort of a way to get his stuff to market. And I also just want to mention um, Top Box Foods. I don't know if y'all know them, but they're um, you know relatively new, a couple years now. They deliver fresh food to neighborhoods who don't have grocery stores, and they're starting to source locally. They uh, buy food from my garden, and they're looking for other local farms to sell food to. Um, recognize that their mission is to provide food for lower income neighborhoods. So that not yet, not yet, not yet. They're expanding slowly. They're expanding slowly, um, but they're doing really good work. Top box, yep, they're doing really good work, and they're, um, you know, they're they're actually two Tulane kids. One of them graduated, and one is still in school. So I, I don't know about you guys, but I was out drinking when I was their age. So they're delivering food to low-income neighborhoods. Um, so I, you know, I think they're they're trying to do really good work, but just recognize that that needs to f factor into your budget that they're. Um, that they're, you know, trying to keep things af affordable, and so we sell, sell it at a, a lower cost to them than we would, say, a, a restaurant. Something to think about. So I've got a question, perhaps more for Pepper. If you go back, oh, let's say in the last four years, you had Good Eggs oh, sure. that had a very good yeah. market delivery, very favorable for a lot of growers, including us. We sell capstone raw honey, and they sold a lot of honey for us. Mm -hmm. They had a market that was able to find a higher dollar niche market mm -hmm. where they delivered, took online orders, and really got the growers top dollar for their produce. Mm -hmm. Then their parent company overnight shut them down in New Orleans. Um, and now, as you talk about farmer's market, just, I think it was last week, got a notice that Holly Grove has now shut down. We've had some other farmer's markets that have tried it and shut down. Um, what do you see as far as the stability 
of the access point for the healthy food? Another question. So what I've noticed over the past four years is groups like, say, Recirculating Farms, who offer classes and who work within the community, don't really seem to have those same challenges. What I've noticed is that um, areas where we do have growers who are uh, providing food, like Capstone, or um, who else is down there? Um, oh God, I can't think of Jenkins the Windows Farm. She has Gorilla Garden, but she has another one too. Right, so p folks who are doing that work, I find that they don't have the same challenges. Um, so the, the news that, <laughs> that rocked Urban Gardening last week was uh, that Holly Grove had closed. And, the, and so there are a number of reasons that people have suggested that Holly Grove closed that range anywhere from the uh, lack of popularity with CSA boxes these days, and that goes to either uh, the, in the, which is interesting, right? So there's food waste in the CSA boxes because people don't know how to cook everything that's in there or it's too much or not enough or whatever. Um, all the way to the opening of Costco, because mm -hmm. anyone who can afford $25 a week in a CSA box can certainly afford to go over to Costco. Maybe it really wasn't a moral decision, it was just an access decision, or maybe it was social capital that they were utilizing by going to Holly Grove. And then there are others who are somewhere in the middle and saying, well, yeah, you know, it was supposed to have gone into Holly Grove, it was supposed to have been for the community, and what it ended up being was a lot of people who weren't from here who were coming in mm -hmm. and just buying stuff and then leaving. So it didn't really support the neighborhood. When I think of urban gardeners and I think of folks like to, uh, who are running Top Box, who are trying to, to bring access into areas that are underserved, right, I, I'm reminded of Mr. Okra, Mm -hmm. and how he had a thriving business for many, many years because that was exactly his model. So, God rest his soul, I believe that there will always be a need to reach folks who don't have an alternative to get out. And I also believe that there will always be support for people who support the communities in which they work. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so I'll preface this question with the fact that I'm not from here. I'm actually from Charleston, South Carolina. And I do a lot of work with uh, solar, and so one of the things I was going to ask is about zoning and kind of like the definitions within these ordinances <coughs> and how you guys deal with them. I know, for example, one of the biggest issues we have these hearings for conditional use permits to have solar projects, and we get a lot of pushback from the community. Um, you know, people are like, "Not in my backyard. This is a great idea, but you know, this is my. I don't want. I don't want this. You know." And so I was wondering, you know, how how is the community supporting Urban Ag here, and whether or not that's enough of a factor that would, I guess, to push legislators in one way or another. Because I know, for example, one thing that we do is we kind of have to go out in the community and we do these things, but a lot of the times when they reach out to the community, the community is just like, well, who cares? <laughs> you want to start? Start? Yeah, well, start. from my perspective, I have yet to find anyone, whether they're from the community we work with immediately or trying to start their own garden, even on the other side of the city, that when I explain what some of the zoning changes have been, it finds favor with that. What you have is a development authority and a city council that looks at is it every lot as wanting to be in the hands of a developer, so they pay lots of taxes. Um, if you look at the newest zoning, they've even become more restrictive on honeybees than what the state guidelines are. Um, you know. People because people are afraid of bees, right? That? Because people are afraid of bees. Like, that's their but rationale. What I find out is yeah. if you spend five minutes with them, they realize, oh, we need bees. Bees are not that bad. <coughs> I mean, I've got 60 hives with bees. I have 30 of those in the lower ninth ward. I don't have any issues because I've educated all of my neighbors. All, you know, a little jar of honey goes a long way. <laughs> uh, but they all love it. Um, I've got two acres in Plaquemines Parish where I have 30 hives. Even all the, I mean, there's tons of citrus out there. They're all 100% supportive. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we're going to get a lot more citrus because you've got bees. You know, you're growing even a backyard garden. Mm -hmm. Even if you just do flowers around your house. Bees are going to give you a more bountiful garden of any type. Um, but the city just tries to quash that. 
Um, you know, used to be able to have backyard goats. Um, how many of you have been around the city and seen roosters and chickens hollering around the streets? Feral chickens? Yep. Feral chickens. Roosters, Feral chickens. roosters are illegal. <laughs> so when you see one, remember that's an exotic species <laughs> that is not allowed because that's what the city says. It's ridiculous. Um, and it goes on and on. And they don't even make the z new zoning simple for aquaculture. You have to look at two completely separate areas of zoning. One, it specifically says aquaculture has to be inside. Now, so far, no one's pushed the issue whether a hoop house with an enclosure constitutes inside. inside. <laughs> um, the second part that most people don't know is if you look at a swimming pool, it talks about water features. Any water feature with a depth of over 18 inches is considered a swimming pool, and so now your water, your aquaculture system now also falls under swimming pool regulations, yep. which says you have to have a six foot solid fence all the way around it. You have to have six foot of clearance along one complete side for egress if you fall in, on and on and on. And you know, back when I was working in law enforcement. I actually worked with our town attorney to write some of the new city ordinances. And I said, Chuck, I said, this makes sense, but we're stating it differently over here. And they appear to me to conflict with each other and not work together. He says, well, you know, my job as city attorney is to make sure that if there's a problem, we're 100% guaranteed to win. So if you find a way around this regulation, we're going to get you on this one. So, and I'll, I'll chime in too. Um, zoning's, d zoning is definitely um, a challenge. The upside is that our enforcement isn't that great in New Orleans. <laughs> 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 and so, um, and, and, and all right, so I'm kidding, sort of. Uh, but it also depends. It depends, it depends on how well the city knows you. It depends on who you are. Um, that's not fair. But it is also so. Uh, I mentioned the two acres in Plaquemines Parish. I got that after city council approved the last zoning because I felt it to be threatening enough with their new changes I had to some, have something completely outside of their jurisdiction where I could continue my mission even if they decided to say, you're done. Yeah, and that's, that's sad. You shouldn't have to do that. So I think, you know, the, the short message is, is, yes, zoning's a challenge. Sometimes you get away with it, sometimes you don't. Um, we need to make it stable for everyone. And... I have had mostly people who love urban ag and are ecstatic to have us in their neighborhood. In fact, I've had people beg us to open a farm in their neighborhood so much that now we're doing a mobile um, wellness vehicle where we're taking our classes and trainings and stuff out to different neighborhoods. Um, but I've also had the opposite where um, they built, they, uh, the developer in our, in our neighborhood built four <coughs> townhouses across from my farm in Central City, and they sold for $500,000 each, and they considered our farm an eyesore and a nuisance instead of a benefit to the neighborhood, and they consistently complained to code enforcement, which was completely untrue, that our compost pile smelled. Our compost pile was on the um, far right corner of a half acre lot, which means the um, townhouses across the street not only couldn't smell it, but couldn't see the compost pile. Um, and the compost pile actually backed up to Houston's restaurant, who loved us and never said a word about the compost, or the chickens that also abutted their restaurant, because we would give them herbs and things for the, for the um, restaurant. And so, it, you know, it just turned into a not in my backyard. So I, I have experienced both, depending on the, on the person. Yes. I'm the stormwater manager for Jefferson Parish, so my question is stormwater runoff, really. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's more of a comment in, 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 um, than a question. And I don't know if you know this, but um, we regulate industries and we, we regulate um, and we educate folks about um, water quality related issues when it comes to stormwater runoff. Except the farming and the, the groups, they're very strong and um, and, and, and nobody can touch them when it comes to um, 
to, to great regulation environment. Since we're in an environmental um, law summit, I, I thought I would bring this up. Um, the runoff that comes from, from farming um, um, uh, processes and, and, um, and is, is includes you know uh, pesticides, um, uh, fertilizers, and, and 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 stuff that has high what we call nutrients, which has you know phosphorus and, and nitrogens contents, which which causes the, 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 the high algae blooms, which causes the, the, the huge um, um, hypoxia, <coughs> the hypoxia uh, zone in the Gulf, which is, which is bigger than the, the state of, of Rhode Island right now, and the Gulf of Mexico, just south of the state of, of, of Louisiana right now, and it's, it's, it's getting, getting bigger by the day. And, and, but yet, we are not regulating the farming industry, and, and, and I'm not even thinking about it, and I'm not, and I'm not and I'm not, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not, of course, we, we need the farming because we need to eat, like you said, we need <coughs> food, and we cannot go hungry, and I understand that. But are we ever going to start thinking about the, the, the dangers that's coming out of those farms, whether they are urban or rural? I mean, sure. Rural, because since we're in the environmental low summer, sure, I'm yeah. So I'll put my other hat on just briefly. So I also have worked in ocean management for a lot of years and worked specifically on the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And actually, most of my clients are fishermen. So, so I'm really concerned about urban runoff. Um, I'm going to say two things to that. One, the farms in New Orleans um, don't even come close to the kind of levels that we've seen in, in other places. Two, I think that's a good argument for sustainable and organic growing, which a lot of our folks here in New Orleans are unbelievably committed to um, smart, careful resource use. I know I speak for David, me, and several of my other farming buddies that we are better than organic in a lot of ways that we only use <coughs> stuff that we've either made ourselves or, or um, you know, like I said, are better than the organic standards, even though we're not certified organic because it's hide hideously expensive and you wouldn't do it for a small scale or even a large scale urban farm. You just wouldn't do it. It's too expensive. Um, but I think um, the way to get toward better farming practices is to get more people involved in farming and to be thoughtful about the entire ecosystem and environment and note that we are a coastal community even though we're not on the coast we are a coastal community we have the mississippi river we connect directly to the bayous um, and i do and i do think that's something that needs to be built into smart good farming practices even in a city but i can tell you from my experience with all of the growers here we are we are a very clean green bunch of growers so yeah go ahead well, when i think of farming at the neighborhood level i as an old timer i go back to the parkway parkers community yeah. garden oh, yeah. i go back to probably sure. the 70s or yeah. the 80s they still exist i'm wondering what lessons we can learn from those gardens positive and negative and how it applies to the kinds of efforts you have underway today you guys want to talk about that want me to talk about it yeah. <laughs> okay um well, so, you know, it's funny, we had a, a whole conversation about, like, victory gardens and, and such in my, in my classroom, like, this week, because, um, you know, farming has been a part of, of urban living for a long time. I mean, we maybe lost that for a little bit somewhere, but it's, it's been an important part because it's not just about the food. It's also about the community. It's also about the socialization. It's also about um, feeling like you've, you've, achieved something. I mean, I know for me, there is nothing better than when I put something in the ground and I can eat it a couple of months later. I'm so excited about that salad. <laughs> it's just like the best salad you've ever had or the best strawberries you've ever had because you, you did it. Um, so I think there's, I think there's more to the urban, to, ev to all growing, but especially urban growing um, than, than just food as if that's not enough. Um, and I think, you know, we've learned a lot that community gardens bring community. So I think that's something that's really really important. I, I wanted to mention one more thing about stormwater since we were talking about stormwater. The other thing too, and Kevin's working on this, is that a lot of these farms are great for stormwater management because we flood so much in New Orleans. Was talking about earlier yeah. Right, the infrastructure. Yeah, because we can absorb more water, we can channel uh, more water. We are in, in it's Ebola, actually. This is, we, we teach people that because we want to retain our, our uh, stormwater because we, we, we cannot just keep 
pumping it and right. into um, okay. yeah. the lake because the more we pump, the more we pollute. I mean, that's I mean, right. Uh, oh, face yeah. it. I mean, this is this is a fact. Yeah. So I think we it's want, a good we thing. We want the trees to, yeah. to drink the water rather than pump in polluted water to the lake. I mean, that, or to the river. <laughs> right on. That's a fact. Yeah. David. Yes. Yes. Um, I wanted to comment <laughs> on the water drainage as well as the rooftop garden. Yes. 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 Can you look at that real quick? I can. Do you still want to do that? Or do we have someone that can so do So go that? native trees. Yeah. We're in yeah. Wait, what? Go native yeah. trees. Anyway. Yes. Native. So. Are you in charge? Because um, I want you to be in charge of the thing. That <laughs> Come talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to give you my card. <laughs> so I mentioned University of D.C. And one of the things that they focus on and have tons of use in D.C. is rooftop gardens. Because D.C. has already done the drain water initiative. Yeah. D.C., not only you're looking at different tax rates, but you're looking at penalties if you have runoff water. Yeah. Um, the latest building that is lit, lead, I think, two or three that UDC has, they actually have like 30,000 gallons of underground storage. It's piped up to the roof for their green gardens. Um, I toured even Washington Stadium, mm -hmm. where above all the flat roof of all the concession areas, they're doing container gardening, five gal or milk crates with five-gallon containers in those milk crates. The entire rooftop is coated in entirely growing food or succulents. Um, we saw another one on top of an old parking garage, the top floor, another one on top of a hardware store. Um, every commercial building, they're almost paying people to put green gardens there so they don't have to pay the taxes and the penalties. And so um, the other thing on the water runoff that Mary Ann talks about recirculating farms and what we're doing. Um, with aquaculture, or many times hydroponics, we're actually recirculating the same water. Um, so I can grow using 75% less water than my in-ground gardens. I also have 1,100 gallons of water storage from my roof. And so it takes two inches of rain to fill those barrels. But it will also keep my animals watered and my aquaculture topped off for five weeks without rain where I don't have to use municipal water. Um, so there are we do some... Have, I, I recall last year we went for almost two and a half months without any rain. That's right. I mean, as much, we, we get 65 inches of rain a year, which is which is astounding. But but we do go for a long time sure. without any rain, too. That's why storage is, is, is important. It's a semi-drought, you know, periods of time. So we do, you know, we, we do need that, that, that much, you know, um, water in, in those areas. So, gang, I just want to tell you, we're past time. I'm happy to stay and talk and answer more questions. For those of you who have to leave or want to leave, you're welcome to, but I'm also happy to stay and talk more. So I just want to say thank you for coming. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to Kelly, who had to run out and take care of something for us. Um, and we'll hang out and talk. <laughs>